Hi, this is a show that answers the questions that expats, nomads, and full-time travelers living across the globe ask themselves every day. These insights and secrets are shared when we interview experts and authors from across the globe. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Nomadic Diaries. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to one of my favorite Scotsman in the world. I would like you to meet John Doherty, who moved here to San Miguel 16 years ago from another part of Mexico. He and his wife were previously bankers in their professional careers. However, in their rewirement, because we don't talk about retirement, and certainly not John, um, they moved to San Miguel and they are part of the beloved snowbird community that we embrace here every year. Welcome, John Doherty. Thank you, Doreen. That's lovely words. Thank you for the nice introduction. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast to talk to us. I would love to ask you a little bit about what initially attracted you to San Miguel, please. Community, as you mentioned in the lead-in, I was, Sean and I lived in, in the Baja California Sur for a few years, and it changed. It changed so much. There was very little culture, very little community. So we went driving through Mexico and found San Miguel. And that took place about 16 years ago. What? So you went driving yeah. through Mexico 16 years ago. Now, some people yes. think driving through Mexico is rather crazy. Sounds to me like you are not lost. You were just exploring. Is that true? Absolutely. And I guess in fairness, 16 years ago, it was somewhat different. Um, yeah. We took the ferry from to the mainland from La Paz and we drove. We drove everywhere as far south as Acapulco far north as Chihuahua and Durango, and everywhere in between, every beach town we looked at to see where we could spend winter months. Found San Miguel by accident on the way back to Mazatlan, <laughs> stayed a few months, and then the story goes on as for most of us, we found a place that there was real community, real need uh, for service, and real group of people that were not here for their egos, but were here to help people that, that had a need for a hand up in life. And that's why we chose to live here. So you found, what I heard you say was you found a purpose when you came here. Would that be true? Uh, I think so. We, we always, I mean, Sean and I have always been involved in community projects or charities uh, in Canada for many, many years in different organizations. We were looking for, for something that our skills could help with. We could spend time with them. We did that. We, when we came to San Miguel, we explored lots of nonprofits. We looked at where the greatest need might be and particularly how we could help. And there's one thing looking for, for organizations that, that have real need, but if you don't have skill sets to, to offer to help or to be constructive in terms of yes. their improvement, it doesn't work. And we looked long and hard to find organizations that we could help. So you were aware that you were bringing skill sets with you. It was like you have, I call it your invisible suitcase. You have your physical suitcase with your clothes and stuff in it. But then we have our invisible suitcase, which is our mindset and our skills and our attitudes, right? Exactly. So it sounds exactly. like you brought that with you. So can you tell me a little bit about how you zoned in on the idea of the deaf school? Sure. It was, I think, honest to say and fair to say it was by accident. I'm a Rotarian here in San Miguel, a wonderfully active club. We were asked, the Rotary Club was asked to help a group of people that used to be central to Crescimento, an organization that helped children with disabilities. And there was a group of kids, uh, deaf kids, that needed some help. And Rotary went to help. I and four or five others. We did that. We raised some money for them to keep them afloat. But I couldn't find out how these kids were being educated. So I stayed. And I became their funding source to keep them afloat and to find out how to get a better education, or at least an education. Because many of these kids were either in the public school system floundering or was still at home in silence. So there was a real need mm -hmm. to start a school and to work on these. And so we decided to take that on, but it was it was never, a, that was not a goal. It was not something that yes. we knew about or knew the community, deaf community. It was just, it just happened. That's one of life's paths. Yes. So it sounds like it was somewhat serendipitous 
And it was an opportunity that you tripped over. And let me ask you, have you seen this happen to other expats in this community in San Absolutely. Miguel? Absolutely. Candidly, uh, many people get involved in groups, such as a service club, like Poetry. And these groups are leaders and people that take on different projects. So yeah, it, it happens a lot, particularly in San Miguel, particularly in a community like the one that we we live in for part of yes. the year. It's a wonderful, wonderful giving community. Um, can you tell me what year did you become involved with the deaf school, please? I got involved in the deaf community about 15 years ago, 14, oh. 15 years ago. I started to actively be involved with this little school that we started in 2010, 2011. And then 2012, after doing a needs analysis and working with the parents and working some some municipal people and other organizations. We opened a school in August of 2000. 2000 so, August of 2012, did you say? 2012 was the date of official opening of the school, yeah. So you've been doing this for 14 years. Yes. Um, no, but, sorry, uh, yeah. 12 years, yes, but mostly yeah. 14, more, more or less yeah. 14 years. And, the, and what has this done for you? You know, often when we talk about giving back to the communities, people talk about how they are able to rewire themselves into a community um, through sharing their gifts and their skills and their talents. But tell me, what was your personal experience, please? As far as what we get back, yes. we all. Yes. I mean, part of the discussion that we, I hope to have with you today is the fact that anyone that decides to make a change late in life or head for another mission late in life, my full recommendation is go for it. Like we have had so much more given back to us through these kids and others uh, for starting this little school and working with the whole community to provide an opportunity, a, a life, a, a dream for these special yes. kids. It's, uh, it's remarkable. I mean, the people who really want to give don't do it for ego or for, for self gratification. They do it because they want to help. They want to reach out. And believe me, the, the, what the rewards that Sean and I and others have received from starting this school have been immense. Can you give me an example of that, John? I wish we had known these kids and, and children with disabilities 20 years ago. That's my <laughs> only regret. Uh, we waited too long to get to know and to understand children with different abilities, not disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's changed us. It, made, it makes us more, if that's possible, more grateful for what we have, more grateful yes. for friends like you and family. It makes us more appreciative of the little things in life that we take so much for granted from countries that have a little bit more. And the folks here, are, family is a big thing. Helping each other is a big thing. What they give back to the expat community is immense. And it's really had an impact on both Sean and I and everyone else involved in the school. Yes. Yeah. Everyone I talk to, I know two or three of your volunteers. And um, everyone I talk to is just in love with the school. And yes. you can tell that it's a passion because yes. it shines out of their eyes. Yes. And every word they say about it is, is really impregnated with a sense of love and honor and understanding. So That's true. this is a big a big mission. You've taken on a big mission. It's interesting, so though, how, how life affects all of us. When we uh, agreed to open the school, and I agreed to lead it in part, and take over the chair of the, the board of trustees, I said that in three years, we would step back after three years. And here we are, 11 years along the way, still very actively involved. So it's funny how, you know, I feel maybe I can give something in a short period of time, within a short period of time, but then you grow into loving, being passionate about the results that these children are receiving, not the results we're getting, but the results children are getting as far as the future for them. Yeah. And time then becomes a constant. That's terrific. So... Well, the next question I would like to ask you is, can you talk about some of the challenges along the way that you have faced since you've been involved and supporting the school for so long? I mean, the, the easy answer to that, or one of the easy answers to that is funding. There's no government yeah. support for, for schools like ours. 
right, the one that we support. So all of the funding to support the schools, salaries, overhead costs, operating or co- operation costs, and so on and so forth. Just providing the right curriculum for these kids to get an education, we have to raise. So that's a major ongoing challenge, not only for us, but for any nonprofit organization. But one of the bigger challenges we've discovered is uh, earning the respect and trust of the families of these special children. They look at people mm. like white hair and, and lighter skin. And they wonder how long we're going to be around. So they question yeah. whether or not they take their children out of the public school system and entrust them into our care, how long we'll be around, how much good work we'll continue to do if we if they figure we're doing good work. So we had to earn that. It took years. It took quite a few years of working in patience and uh, due diligence to make the families you know, accept that we are here for a long haul for their children. So that was a big undertaking and a big challenge. And I would say that part of that is cultural, don't you agree? We talk a lot on this podcast about cultural intelligence, intercultural communication, and yes. cultural competencies. Yes. And you are an expat with expat volunteer who are looking to serve the Mexican community. And that is kind of a flip of the cultural script that we often see, like, you know, Mexicans serving Americans in the States, yes. right? Yes. So that's quite a juggle for them. It's quite a stretch for them to yes, entrust their most beloveds into your care. I can understand that. Yes, it is. But also part of that cultural difference or cultural challenge for the families is they, they also have to overcome, apart from the trust for people like me that's trying to reach out to help their kids through the school, they also have to come to grips with the fact that they have a child that is a little different, that they yes. have lived for years with this child that not fitting into the public school system or society as a whole, yeah. as kids, and in some cases grief, in some cases shame because the yeah. child is not perfect. So there's yes. all of that that goes on at the same time as working with an expat group like ours. And it's right. not, I mean, it's a Mexican school run by Mexican people. It just so happens that we have to be there to direct it and to raise money, but we are very, yes. you know, the focus is on us rather than perhaps on many of the yes. people who work in the school. I say, if that makes sense, if I, my explanation of that is... Oh, yeah. yeah, that makes perfect sense. And one of the things that we don't acknowledge about intercultural living and experiences is all the losses that are involved. And yeah. it seems to me that the deaf community is like another culture. Yes, absolutely. Not only are you helping and supporting but you're actually crossing and bridging cultures with these kids every single day. And you're practicing cultural competencies, you're practicing awareness, and that takes time and awareness. I mean, it hats off to you for the incredible work that you have done. So Just on that, though, just on that, Lorraine, so my head doesn't get too large. I am just one of many, many. I, I realize that. Yes. I happen to be the front person, but there are so many good people. And today people. you're being the spokesman for all of them. You bet. You bet. <laughs> and what a great spokesman. I mean, after all, I have to share this with the listeners. If you recognize a wee bit of uh, similarity in our accents, <laughs> it's because we both grew up in the same neighborhood in Glasgow, Scotland. Of course, our lives took very different turns, John, but we still have but we built that Scottish accent, right? Absolutely. And and Scottish <laughs> beliefs and Scottish heritage. Yes, and, and our values as well. We have Scottish absolutely. values as well. So just in closing, what would you say to someone who's considering and who's on the brink of moving abroad? And I would like to ask you what you would say to them based on your experience. And considering moving abroad, I think people should start immediately, especially to a developing country like Mexico, start to immediately look at how they can best downsize their life, their expectations, if you will, as far as the things that they have accumulated over the years. Also to, to start 
to think about how they can provide service to others because there's so many people that have so many needs. Uh, and be grateful. Start to think about, you know, when you're moving into something new, some new mission in life, realize just how much endowed with, mainly through your your place of birth and your place of your choice of countries that you have been living in. So when you start to move to another country, start to be more grateful for what you have and it will stand you in good stead to, to give back to the country that you adopt and live in, whether it's on a regular basis or, or as a snowbird, such as Sean. Those ideas are terrific. You talked about downsizing, you talked about evaluating your skills, and you talked about practicing gratitude, which are yeah. three great topics of wisdom, I think, for anyone who's considering moving over sees is before we close can you share an inspiring story or the achievement of one of the children at the deaf school that you think exemplifies the good work you're doing gosh there's so many uh, i will single out one little boy who's a deaf blind his name is diego he came to us about seven six or seven years ago his mother had carried her carried him on her hip because he had other physical challenges also. We got some help from uh, from a lady who had worked with deaf blind children in the States for many years. We've sent our children and our, our, student, our children, our teaching staff on, a, uh, on courses because we had never worked with a child who was both deaf and blind. So moving forward all these years, and he's still with us, comes in two or three days a week, and we send someone to, to his home to work with his mom. He's grown, he's bigger, and now, now he's really worked well with the other children in the school. Our challenge now for this boy is, is to try and get his physical attributes improved a little bit. He has trouble with his mobility. But uh, it's wonderful to see uh, teaching staff working with this little boy, teaching him sign language through a very unique manner so that he understands some vocabulary and he's developing and we are so proud and so happy to have this boy in our school. That's lovely. That's a testament to the great work that's done. So we are going to be putting into the show notes that go along with the link to this podcast information about the Deaf School. We're going to put in some links to you and to the Deaf School. Do you also have have a link where people can give a contribution that we can share? Yes, we could we could provide to you the website that has the throughput, I guess, to make donations to the school. One thing I would ask, if it's possible, uh, the, the terminology, more proper terminology or politically correct statements in recent times have been that it is a school for the deaf rather than the deaf school. Yes, of or, course. <laughs> well, a child who is deaf, <laughs> rather than you know, a deaf child. Right. So just so I would ask it, that you could word that or state that in a fashion if that's okay to the school for the deaf and some of the other rather than the deaf school. If that's possible, I would appreciate it. The school for the deaf? Yeah. In San Miguel. Yes. We can definitely do this. And this is part of cultural in, uh, competency. It's yes. becoming accustomed to the new vocabulary that we need yes. to use that yes. is less triggering, more inclusive, and is satisfying to everyone. And yes. so this is a wonderful example of how to grow through that. What resources or support systems have assisted you in being so uh, consistent, so resolute, and so generous with the School for the Deaf in San Miguel? There, there are many. We have about five or 600 supporters that are regular donors, some small, some large. We have established relationships with different foundations, uh, as well as charitable trusts in the States and Canada. We get support from universities and deaf um, colleges and universities in the States and Canada. And a large part of funding for the last 12 years has been through grants from organizations such as Rotary International. Who have been, we've been very grateful for the support we've received from Rotary, from different clubs, different districts, and Rotary International. 
So you'll be very blessed with the type of people that are supported this in the school. And I believe you're the only school in, in Mexico. Are there are there any plans for other there, schools for the deaf? There are other schools, and there's a large school in the Mexico City called Ipnia that uh, we went to initially when we decided to open the school, and they have actually mentored us in a little bit. Uh, they have 150 students in Mexico City registered. Uh, they, only, they do uh, primary and middle school. They have no training programs. That's just what we offer for older students. Uh, but they're a fine school doing good work. There's a couple of other deaf organizations throughout my school, but not many, not many schools, maybe, maybe four or five. And some of these are part of the public school system. We have, yes. uh, if I can share, we have a, an, an upcoming session next week with the American professors from the National Technical Institute for the Deaf coming. And the reason I mention that is there are 26 deaf edu educators of the deaf community from all over the state coming to spend a week in San Miguel to be trained, to receive better training through these professors and associate professors from the United States of America. So what we're trying to do is develop a better education, a better training uh, program for deaf educators, for people who are educating the deaf children through, through the state and, and hopefully through the rest of Mexico because there's no formal structure and never has been. There are special education programs, but not aimed specifically at children who are deaf. Well, that's wonderful. It sounds like you're going to be very busy. So I feel extremely honored that you have squeezed Nomadic Diaries into the, your schedule, because that sounds like that it will be a big impact event in terms of scaling what you've already started. I agree. And much of what we will spend the next seven days, eight days uh, on, and then and then continue for the next 18 months with the same professors. They will be visiting San Miguel several times. It's all open sourced, free information. So everything is taped and videoed and recorded and taught and trained will be passed on to anyone who's involved in, within the deaf community uh, as we go forward. So it's a pretty exciting stuff and a huge step forward, hopefully. It's a real good way to start 2000. We really appreciate you taking the time and the energy to talk to our listeners about two things. Number one, um, what's possible in your retirement or your rewirement and, and how you can find a place to make a difference and be uh, and deliver your brilliance because everybody, I believe that everybody has some sort of skills and brilliance to offer. Wouldn't you agree, John? I absolutely agree. Yeah. And the second thing is, thank you so much for sharing the specific information on the School for the Deaf in San Miguel and um, a little bit about your enthusiasm regarding the beautiful community that exists here in San Miguel because we're all so fortunate that uh, we have landed here in some form. So I really appreciate you sharing with our listeners um, all these golden nuggets of wisdom. Is there anything that you would like to say in closing that we haven't covered? I, I don't think so. I think uh, you, the purpose of, uh, of our earlier discussion and what we tried to cover today was uh, the wisdom and the mission and, and the value of of taking a step into another area of, of, of your life, living in a different country and exploring opportunities to help people. And, and I think that's, to end on a note, that's that's really the only note that has got tremendous value, whether it's with the School for the Deaf or any other organization, particularly one that helps kids or young women is a worthwhile endeavor and one that everyone should consider as they get into so-called golden years. Of we like to call it the third chapter. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for talking to us, uh, John. And um, 
our listeners, if uh, you would like to participate and, and to support this fabulous endeavor called the School for the Deaf in San Miguel, um, please look at the show notes and you will see a link to the website where you can actually be a beneficial presence by sharing um, your generosity there. And also, if you would like to come uh, to San Miguel and have any skills or expertise uh, in this area, perhaps um, we would love to welcome you to San Miguel to support, to grow this community with John and all of the volunteers who are involved in this. Thank you so much today for this conversation, John, and the best, all the best of success. Thank you very much. Nice talking with you. Take care.